so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about what's being called COVID-19 diabetes or COVID-19 related diabetes and all the uh, opinions flying around this right now. And I, um, I kept seeing chatter in all the medical newsletters and the medical blogs about is uh, COVID causing a new form of diabetes? And then there would be countering arguments. And I was starting to pull those articles uh, together to put something together uh, for you guys when I got a call from our local public health department to help with a 31-year-old uh, quote-unquote homeless man. He was mainly homeless because he had come to Colorado from Florida, had been admitted in severe diabetic ketoacidosis with COVID. So he had COVID, but when he got admitted with COVID, he was in DKA and he had no past history of diabetes and he'd been in the hospital a long time and they were now releasing him uh, from the hospital to finish his isolation in our local travel lodge where public health puts the homeless patients who have uh, COVID and um, they needed some help with his diabetes management which uh, we had a few adventures with that if you can imagine someone uh, never, never having diabetes before and going right into isolation. Um, but we got him, uh, we got him taken care of and he ended his isolation and friends bought him a ticket home to Florida. But this brings up, uh, you know, did this man have type one diabetes waiting to happen? And then with the stress of COVID, it just brought it out. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Could he have been had type 2 diabetes that no one had ever diagnosed or maybe pre-diabetes and with the stress of COVID being so bad that he went into DKA, which is not common normally with type 2 diabetes, but we are seeing a lot of DKA and type 2 with uh, COVID. Or could he have this new onset COVID-19 diabetes, whatever, uh, whatever that is. Um, and I can't see you guys at all. So this is making me a little crazy. What can, what can I do to kind of see you? Oh, well, I'll just let the slides go and then I'll look at all of you. There you go. Yeah, you can do gallery view if you'd like to as well. Uh, it's okay. going to speaker view up on the top right hand corner if you want to see everybody's mug. Oh, well, I can't. I can't master that right now. For some reason, it's not coming up. So, okay. Um, so this New England Journal of Medicine article kind of talked about there's, you know, two things going on. One is, um, or this bi-directional relationship between COVID and diabetes. On one hand, people with diabetes have a high risk of having a severe case of COVID or even dying. So diabetes results in severe COVID-19. On the other hand, COVID-19 seems to be causing new onset diabetes and severe uh, acute complications of diabetes, like diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar syndrome, with the requirement of very, very high doses of insulin. So we've got COVID causing uh, severe diabetes complications and diabetes causing severe COVID complications. So we're going to kind of dissect through that a little bit. So starting with diabetes causing severe COVID complications, we, we know that it's an underlying um, condition for disease severity and mortality. And it's about a three times increased risk that our patients face uh, if they require admission for, um, for diabetes. And so people have wondered, well, is it diabetes per se or is it the hyperglycemia um, or what is it that's causing this risk? Uh, so papers have been coming in and early on, there were a lot of pre-publication papers <laughs> and they weren't vetted or they weren't peer reviewed. And so now we're gonna try to look at papers that are being published that have a little bit more vetting and peer review to them. So I had seen this data earlier uh, it's now been published uh, out of, out of uh, Wuhan, China, where this all started. 
where they admitted people who did not have a previous diagnosis of diabetes. And based on what they call their admitting fasting blood sugar, they retrospectively stratis stratified them as how they responded to the COVID illness. And those who were admitted with what they call normal fasting blood sugar below 110 had a much better survival. And then it was sort of gradients from there. If they had an admitting fasting blood sugar in the pre-diabetes range, they had a higher mortality than those with normal blood sugar. And if it was in the diabetes range, they had an even higher mortality, as you can see there. And the same for complications. If they were in the pre-diabetes range, they had increased complications, but even more so if they were in the di diabetes range upon admission. Um, they, um, they assumed that most of these people uh, did not have a pre-existing diabetes, but they maybe had undiagnosed diabetes, or maybe they just had acute stress hyperglycemia. Regardless of why their blood sugar was high, um, they did poorly if their blood sugar was high. And so that at the end of this paper, they recommended glycemic testing and control of glycemia for all COVID patients, because even if they didn't have a pre-existing diagnosis of diabetes, they did poorly if they had high blood sugar. So their recommendation was, you know, get on it, address that blood sugar with the diagnosis of COVID, and that will help protect the patient. Um, then it, this sort of uh, summary of, um, of papers uh, at a primary care diabetes on the impact of hyperglycemia on outcomes reviewed other patients from China. And if their blood sugar during the hospitalization mainly remained between 70 and 180, they had a lower mortality rate. And those people with blood sugars mainly over 180 had a higher mortality rate. And they looked at the group with what they called good glu controlled glucose, 70 to 180. They also had lower inflammatory and coagulation markers. They required less aggressive treatment, less need for oxygen or ventilation. So all around better outcome in addition to mortality. And then uh, a US study, um, where they looked at patients with diabetes or hyperglycemia without a diagnosis of diabetes. And if the patients had diabetes or new onset hyperglycemia, whatever the cause of hyperglycemia, they had a, a longer length of stay and a higher mortality, um, uh, much higher. So they, their summary was that Optimal uh, glycemic control during hospitalization with COVID significantly improved uh, the patient's um, outcome. So this uh, study um, was out of the PISA, Italy, COVID study, but it's been shown by also a US study that if someone has no diagnosis of diabetes and has normal blood sugar during COVID, they have the better outcome. If they have diabetes, but their blood sugar is controlled between 110 and 180, or for someone with a high risk of low blood sugar, 140 to 180, that they had a fairly decent outcome. But if they had diabetes and their blood sugars were uncontrolled, they had a worse outcome. But the worst outcome of all was someone with no past history of diabetes and uncontrolled blood sugar. So these studies are beginning to show, and I'll show you a couple more, that it's both diabetes and hyperglycemia that impact the outcome with diabetes. And they're probably sort of almost independent because if you don't have diabetes, but you have hyperglycemia, you have a really bad outcome. And if you have both, you have a bad outcome. So um, it, it looks like it's both, um, which it's, it's very interesting and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, this paper I think was really helpful in this understanding why hyperglycemia per se, even without diabetes, 
can be uh, so bad uh, with COVID-19. One thing is that having even your blood sugar shoot up acutely, new onset hyperglycemia still triggers this marked increase in inflammatory markers, which can then be, make that cytokine storm more likely and more harmful. We already talked on a past uh, ECHO session that diabetes uh, and high blood sugar in particular impairs both the adaptive and the innate immune system. So people with blood sugars over 250 especially have a markedly impaired immune uh, response and so they can't fight off a virus or a bacteria. But what um, studies are showing is that when, when the patient has COVID, the way COVID gets the COVID virus, co uh, SARS-CoV-2, the way it gets into a cell is by binding to an ACE2 receptor. And when the blood sugar is high, it glycosylates that receptor, making it more likely to bind that virus and take the virus into the cell. So here, poor people with high blood sugar can't fight off the virus to begin with, and now more of the viruses is, are getting into more of their cells in addition to the inflammation. So we can see, begin to see how having high blood sugar, <clears throat> even in the absence of diabetes or in the presence of diabetes is so much worse for our patients and how high blood sugar makes the COVID worse. And if we can control that blood sugar, we can help our patients have a greater chance of surviving COVID. Uh, this is uh, a study out of New York. Uh, the first author is uh, a young uh, endocrinologist I have worked with and I'm very proud of. And she was actually, before there was anything published, I was interchanging emails with her. What's happening? What are you seeing with diabetes? And she was very, very helpful in helping me create the initial tools uh, by telling me what she was seeing, I was then able to say, okay, this is what's needed. So now she's uh, working with her partners to publish some of what they've seen. And uh, in, in a large uh, subset of patients with diabetes, they looked at characteristics that the patient came into the hospital with and did that predict who did better and who did worse. And what they found, it wasn't their past blood sugar control that mattered as much, and, and this is the pre-admission, so this is not the in-hospital blood sugar that we looked at in the studies we just reviewed, but when they came in the hospital, if they had been on insulin treatment, which suggested that they'd had diabetes a longer period of time, or if they had a higher BMI, they were more likely to have a complicated uh, course and more likely to actually pass or die from the, from the COVID. And another study uh, that I did not <clears throat> uh, put this full study on, but they showed similar to the longer history of diabetes, that if people with diabetes did have microvascular complications like nephropathy or macrovascular complications like heart disease, that they also had a worse uh, prognosis. And this is a paper that just came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine where they looked at obesity and they controlled for other comorbidities. So is it that people with obesity have a worse outcome from COVID because people with obesity are more prone to uh, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, or is it obesity per se? And what they found with these fancy curves, so the curve that really matters is the turquoise or aqua, whatever color that is, and the purple are the, are the parameters around that curve. But they found the inflection point for doing worse with BMI right around 30, and it really started to go up at 35, and then went up a lot more, showing risk at a BMI of 40. And they found that for patients under the age of 65, that BMI alone, independent of all these different comorbid conditions, uh, worsened the patient's risk of a poor outcome. 
but when they looked at the risk, if they had both diabetes and obesity, it was even higher. And they don't have a, they don't have a graph showing that, but it went from like 1.6 for obesity to 1.9 uh, with uh, obesity and diabetes. Um, and then it's not just obesity. They're beginning to realize it's that visceral fat, the fat inside of the muscles where the, you know, the protruding abdomen fat. And they were doing chest CAT scans to look at the pneumonia from the COVID. And they also took a look at, uh, they could see on that the visceral adiposity, uh, the visceral fat. And if you look at this picture, the dark, the white are uh, organs and bones and the, the dark is the fat and you can see the subcutaneous fat and then you see the layer of muscle and then inside the muscle around the organs you see the visceral fat and the patients with more visceral fat had a worse worse prognosis so it's not just bmi but it's it's that same visceral fat that increases the risk of diabetes and heart disease that also increases the risk with covid um, and then we'll look at the opposite covid19 causing severe diabetic complications and maybe even new onset diabetes. So a lot of letters and alerts and warnings and we're seeing this type of messages coming out from several experts saying it looks like COVID may be triggering a new kind of diabetes and people who had prediabetes or mild diabetes are being triggered by COVID into this severe form of diabetes. And uh, because of all of these uh, concerns, uh, the, some people out of Europe put together uh, a very extensive letter uh, with questions and very, very good questions. Is COVID itself causing diabetes beyond the, the stress response that we would expect to see in anybody who's really sick? Is there something else going on? And if there is, is this a permanent change to the person or will it go away when they get over the COVID? Uh, what kind of diabetes is it causing? Uh, if it does go away, are they gonna be at higher risk later on, et cetera? So lots of good questions. And to help answer those questions, uh, there's an international registry being formed to collect cases of people who had severe COVID, uh, severe diabetes uh, complications from the COVID and new onset diabetes from the COVID, hoping to sort this out and follow these patients long-term so that we know more. So I, I just wanted you to be aware that, that uh, that's just been developed and hopefully we can be learning from it. In the meantime, um, the questions that are out there and being posed by a lot of diabetes experts is COVID-19 related diabetes really just pre-existing undiagnosed pre-diabetes or diabetes being identified because the person's sick with something else coming into the hospital and they're finally getting diagnosed. And there's in the United States, uh, 7.3 million people who walk around with diabetes and don't know it because they've never been diagnosed. And 85% of the 88 million people with prediabetes have never been diagnosed. So could it just be that they're coming into the hospital for the COVID and now the diabetes is being found? And there are people who think that's what COVID diabetes really is. Uh, and that could be coupled with stress hyperglycemia. And we know that stress hyperglycemia can happen with surgery, it can happen with other infections and acute heart attack, that type of thing. It's when uh, you know, a severe stress hit, hits the body and all those stress hormones go high. Well, stress hormones counteract insulin. So if the stress hormones go high enough, the insulin is counteracted to the point even in a person without any pre-existing diabetes or pre-diabetes, but if the stress hormones go high enough, it counteracts the insulin enough that they get high blood sugar. And in the studies on stress hyperglycemia predating COVID, about a third of the people who appeared to have stress hyperglycemia in the hospital actually had pre-existing undiagnosed diabetes. 
A third had pre-existing undiagnosed prediabetes that was probably had higher blood sugars because of the stress. And then a third of people had no pre-existing uh, type of any problem. They had totally normal blood sugars. And then, um, so could, could everything that's happening with COVID just be a severe form of stress hyperglycemia? Or is there something else that this infection is doing to the beta cells or to, to the insulin or the insulin resistance that's creating um, a new form or a worse form of diabetes? So with all this chatter going on uh, among diabetologists, there have been a lot of different interviews and comments and, and such. This one is from Healthline, an interview with Dr. David Nathan, who is the leading diabetologist from Massachusetts General Hospital. And he's on the side that um, it's probably undiagnosed diabetes may be coupled with some stress-induced hyperglycemia, and they're now coming in the hospital and we're identifying them for the first time. And there's been a lot of concern with all the diabetic ketoacidosis that people are seeing with COVID, and could COVID be causing type 1 diabetes? And Dr. Nathan says, well, we've known for years and years that when someone who's getting or developing type 1 diabetes, but not yet manifest that if they get the stress of a virus and, and then that causes all these stress hormones, that that will then cause the, the type 1 diabetes to, to show up at that point. But in fact, the type 1 diabetes has been develop, developing over a period of years with those autoantibodies attacking the beta cells and destroying their ability to make insulin. And the virus just brought out the onset of it that did not cause the diabetes. But other people aren't quite as reassured as Dr. Nathan, and they're worried that COVID might be doing something to actually shut down or actually destroy those beta cells. Um, this immunologist and virologist uh, in uh, Australia uh, just thinks it's probably that COVID is causing such an extreme inflammatory state that this severe inflammation, this cytokine storm, is causing the insulin to shut down and to, to block the insulin resistance. And then that's causing either stress hyperglycemia or making pre-existing pre-diabetes or diabetes worse. Um, this group uh, presented, I'm, I'm forgetting what country they're from now, but anyway, uh, they're from a European country presented um, three cases of new onset diabetes with COVID. Uh, people had never had diabetes before and came in sick with high blood sugars. And they're thinking, well, it probably, um, they probably had some pre-existing problem and then they had the stress hyperglycemia. So, uh, but, but they said, you know, we need to look further. This is a paper out of Lancet Diabetes, which is out of the United Kingdom. Um, and they looked at people coming in with COVID who came in with a diabetic emergency, a hyperglycemic emergency, either DKA or hyperosmol or hyperglycemic uh, coma or a mixture. And um, they, if we look at the 35 patients, uh, th about a third of them had diabetic ketoacidosis, and 81 or almost 82% of those who had diabetic ketoacidosis had type 2 diabetes. We would expect someone with type 1 diabetes, but type 2. And a majority of these were people that did not need insulin in the past. So they weren't insulin dependent or insulin requiring type 2s. Some had a mixture of HHS and DKA, and interesting, a couple of those patients had been on the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, some had just the hyperosmotic syndrome. Some had this hyperglycemic ketosis, where they didn't have acidosis, but they had high ketones, but they, they weren't acidotic, whereas here in the DKA, they had low pHs, so they were acidotic. And then, um, uh, two, of the, two out of the 35 patients had new onset uh, diabetes. 
And what they were struck with in this retrospective study was that uh, so many of the patients who presented in diabetic ketoacidosis had type 2 diabetes. And by the time they were released for the COVID, they still required insulin, that they hadn't recovered their ability to make insulin. And they also noted that the ketosis lasted much longer. Like if you admit someone in diabetic ketoacidosis, you're usually able to get them out of the acidosis within 12 hours. And this required uh, another 24 hours to get the people out. And, and then if they did come in with ketosis or ketoacidosis, if they came in with a bunch of ketones, they, they had a longer stay in the hospital if they survived and they had a higher uh, mortality rate. And they felt that this was really disproportionate to that seen in critical illnesses that we've seen over the years, you know, surgery, heart attack, other infections, influenza, et cetera. And they felt something else must be going on. Mm -hmm. um, this is another uh, paper uh, from the Lancet, um, and I, I believe out of Italy, uh, where they, uh, they recognize that people with diabetes have a worse prognosis, that they have more complications from COVID like we've already talked about. And that's associated with some of the things that we talked about, you know, that would make them more at risk for having a poor outcome. But they thought that the coronavirus itself was a factor that caused the severe diabetic complications. And they surmised that it's a direct effect on the beta cell that, it, that something about the coronavirus is making the beta cell not work, which causes people with type 2 diabetes to go into DKA, people without a previous diagnosis of diabetes to come in severely hyperglycemic or even cause a new onset uh, di diabetes. Um, and uh, this paper in cell metabolism looked at um, people who have extremely high blood sugars and ketones from the SARS-CoV-2. And they looked back and they saw that people who had SARS-CoV-1 often developed autoimmune conditions that could cause something like type 1 diabetes. Uh, and in um, SARS-CoV-2 cell studies and animal studies, they've seen the SARS-CoV-2 in these little lab-grown pancreas cells or in the, uh, the alpha and beta cells, and it actually killed off the alpha and beta cells. So they're saying, well, maybe this ACE2 receptor, which is on the pancreas, is allowing the SARS-CoV-2 virus to infect those beta cells and destroy them. Or another possibility would be that the whole immune response in uh, COVID is so intense that those beta cells are sort of killed off as an innocent bystander, just from the intense, so autoimmune, direct infection, or like innocent bystander from an immune response. Um, this is from the Journal of the Endocrine Society. Um, and it's really an interesting paper. It's a very long paper. It talks about how SARS-CoV-2 can impact the pituitary, the adrenal, the thyroid, the parathyroid, and of course, uh, the endocrine pancreas. And um, they talk about how SARS-CoV-1, the, the past SARS uh, virus, could actually uh, cause new onset diabetes. And in some of the autopsy studies, uh, it looked like there was pancreatic injury in some of these patients. Uh, it looked like um, the SARS-CoV virus was actually inside of, of islets and pancreas tissue in some of the studies, but not in all the studies. So they, you know, they're still trying to figure out if that SARS-CoV-1 virus could infect the islet cells. And there's SARS-CoV-2 hasn't been around long enough to have those kind of autopsy studies or to pull all this data together. And as I told you, that registry has just been 
developed internationally and we'll hopefully be looking at some of this. But what has been noted is that there is a much higher incidence of these hyperglycemic emergencies, the diabetic ketoacidosis and the new onset diabetes than we normally see with things like influenza, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, et cetera. And so based on this and based on a bunch of other observations, uh, these uh, researchers and scientists have proposed what they call a paracrine loop hypothesis, where the SARS-CoV-2 virus actually infects those beta cells that make insulin, causing them to not be able to make insulin or destroying them. And then the person gets hyperglycemia. The hyperglycemia causes that ACE2 receptor to be glycosylated, which allows more virus into the cell. And it just turns into a vicious uh, cycle for the poor patient. And so their bottom line in this paper was regardless of the cause, hyperglycemia predicts a poor prognosis and warrants prompt recognition and uh, correction. And I, I hope you're all still there and this isn't too detailed or too boring. But to summarize it, hyperglycemia and hyperglycemic emergencies worsen the outcome. So if our patients develop severe hyperglycemia and if they develop ketones, they're much less likely to survive, regardless of the type of diabetes or whether or not they had pre-existing diabetes. And if instead their glycemia is controlled, that 110 to 180 range, they have better outcomes. More studies are needed to determine if COVID-19 uniquely impacts or worsens um, or the development of or the worsening of diabetes beyond what is expected just from the stress and inflammation of a bad infection. So could COVID-19 be infecting the islet cells and destroying them or triggering an autoimmune attack on the beta cells that destroys them or just an immune uh, side destruction, the innocent bystander type of destruction. Um, the, the recommendation from all of these papers is that in patients with COVID-19, the blood sugar should be measured and monitored and treated regardless if whether they have an existing diagnosis of diabetes or pre-diabetes or not. And that follow-up of the patients is gonna be critical to see if this worsened or new state of diabetes is permanent or if it, if it improves. And of course, the best option uh, is preventing infection in the first place. So I have a link here to an article from 2015. It was, I thought, a good article. It's one of those interview-based articles on stress hyperglycemia, and it's with one of the doctors from Emory and Grady in Atlanta that I, I worked with and, and admire his, his uh, work in the diabetes field. Um, and again, we've known for years that if someone has stress hyperglycemia and they had no past history of diabetes, that they actually had a worse outcome uh, than someone who was hospitalized with known diabetes. And that may be because uh, the, their stress is so bad, it's causing even their normal beta cells not to work. So it could be that they have worse stress, or it could be that because they didn't have a pre-existing diagnosis of diabetes, people ignore that high blood sugar. And then in, we know high blood sugar impairs healing. We know it impairs immunity. Uh, et cetera. Um, so these are the figures I gave before for if you see someone in the hospital with stress, hyperglycemia, some of them are actually going to have long-standing diabetes and some are going to maybe have the chance of going back to normal, but that makes follow-up really important and all of you will be part of that follow-up once they get out of the hospital. So just a little bit on stress, hyperglycemia, and then um, the, one of the editors of uh, the JAMA uh, journal had uh, 
points, like let's stay healthy, you know. So she had six key points and she pointed out that, you know, everyone else's behavior affects everyone else. You know, we have to do this as the whole ship or the whole ship will sink. So to tell our patients to call before they come to the office, we don't want them exposed in the office and we don't want being exposed from them and there are things that we can help them with and you guys have been doing that. It's a good time to not visit anywhere. <laughs> um, and and uh, I think that's uh, wise uh, to just remember all that basic prevention, hand cleansing, the physical distancing is critical and especially to be away, stay away from people if you have or they have any type of symptoms. The mask not only protects the other person, it actually protects the wearer as well. And the WHO has um, some good things on that and some new things on uh, the best composition of a mask, which is like a cotton inner layer, uh, uh, a kind of a polypropylene mid layer and a uh, more resistant uh, type of outer layer, uh, that something like fleece or the neck gaiters, unfortunately, don't protect anybody as well, either the other person or yourself. Um, anywhere in the US, we're kind of at high risk now. It's not zero anywhere. And to remind people that the less they go out, the better, and especially to avoid those hot spots. And then the American Diabetes Association and Harvard put together guidelines specifically for people with diabetes with the big goal of reducing exposure in the first place. But if they did get infected to prevent that severe hyperglycemia that we just spent uh, several minutes talking about. And I won't go through all of these, but one thing I'll point out is making work as safe as possible. And, and we, having working with our patients to say, look, you're at higher risk, Let's work with your employer. And I have another article for you on that. So all of these are really good points just to constantly remind your patients to try to keep them healthy so they don't get COVID in the first place. And if they get COVID, controlling that blood sugar. I mean, I keep thinking about Robin's patient who she presented last time, who by everything that woman had should have been in the hospital and died but she didn't even have to go to the hospital. And I really think it's because Robin called her daily and helped control her blood sugars using those sick day rules. So it does make a difference. Um, this is an article, this uh, doctor talks about one of his patients in her 60s with diabetes who worked as um, a, a housekeeper in um, a nursing home and uh, early on in, in the pandemic, he kind of tried to talk with her about going to work and trying to stay safe, but she got COVID and she died. And he's just heartbroken. And he goes through, uh, you know, how can we better stratify the people who are working to, to keep them safe? Uh, that's the link to the OSHA guidelines that say, in these jobs, you have a really high risk of being exposed to COVID. And in these jobs, your risk is medium or your risk is low. And he took that and put together sort of uh, a sheet. Now, obviously, if the employer's not understanding or the patient can't get any income and we tell them that they should not work, like up here in category C, that's a whole other problem. But but this, I thought, was uh, something that we haven't really talked about very much on any of, the, any of the different COVID webinars I've been on. So I thought I would share that with you. And then I'm on a federal commission uh, looking at diabetes in the federal agencies. And we've been reviewing community health workers and the payment for community health workers. And in the, my process of reviewing that, I came across this article about community health representatives. And uh, at the very back of it, at the very end of it, was this lovely poem um, that I thought I would just uh, share with all of you. And um, I'll leave that up a minute, but I, I want to see, uh, I want to see you. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. I had, um, 
Candy had called asking, I don't know if she's on, but she had uh, emailed me asking for help with the checklist if the CDEs were going to be calling patients with COVID who were at home getting care. And so I created a checklist for her and I probably made it overly um, detailed. So uh, we shared it with you and you can take out anything you want, but I prefer to put the details there and have you omit them rather than you need them and them not being there. So um, this is kind of just a checklist of things to ask the patient and then tools if, if something comes up some guidelines for what to do. Um, and, you know, this could maybe even be a, a standing order with your clinician if they approve this for some of the insulin adjustments. So um, we, uh, we all need to kind of keep, stay tuned to see um, what people are learning about uh, COVID-19 and whether it actually causes diabetes or causes a worse form of diabetes than people who already have diabetes. But what we do know is that it really does, these six day rules and keeping, helping our patients control their blood sugars and avoid ketones during the time they have COVID, that it's worth it. It does make a difference. So, um, Hopefully, I, I know a lot of you are involved with that. If you want to talk about that or have questions about any of the studies that I showed, please. And, and uh, Carol, we actually do have a couple comments oh, good. in the chat box. And okay. I wanted to catch uh, with Caroline, for sure, with Carrie. She had sent some before she takes off. Um, going back to your ketoacidosis and your uh, keto diet uh, slide, she was asking or stating, I have seen an increase in individuals on a keto diet. Could this be a reason why some of these individuals come in a keto state during the COVID pandemic? That, that's interesting. We do know that going on the keto diet will, if they're on an SGLT2 inhibitor, there have been many, many reports of somebody going on a keto diet while on an SGLT2 inhibitor and going into a keto state, a, a actually ketoacidosis state where the acid builds up in the blood. Um, we all develop ketones if we don't eat or if we don't eat any carbs. And the SGLT2 inhibitors exaggerate that uh, to the point that the kidneys can't get rid of the ketones and they build up in the blood and they're acid. So they create acid in the blood and we're not supposed to have acid in the blood. But you know, I, I will watch for that. I, I don't know if the keto diet and COVID without the SGLT2 inhibitor could do it, but definitely the keto diet and the SGLT2 inhibitor and then COVID definitely could do it. Um, Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think that was really the only other one we had. We did have a comment from Tashina. She may actually have a case oh, good. for next month. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll uh, I'll I'll stick on with uh, Tashina afterwards to see how that goes. She was talking about um, a, a continuous uh, glucose monitor. So questions about sick day rules. Uh, I'm really curious to know what you're seeing in your in your patient populations. If you are, uh, and if you're helping with the follow up at the people with diabetes, and helping to call them and make sure they keep their blood sugars under control. Anybody helping with that process? Um, Dr. Greenlee, I do have a question regarding okay. the, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, you mentioned that the, the increase in BMI, um, in addition to the poor blood sugar control, I uh, uh, actually was wondering about when you have a patient that actually has um, poor blood sugar control that is losing weight at a ridiculous, so their BMI goes down as well. Um, so would like, like in that particular instant, would that BMI, um, like the, I don't want to say benefit or just the lack of the BMI causing more complications with respect to the COVID-19 um, diagnosis, would that be kind okay. of on the table then? 
I probably not because if someone's losing weight because their blood sugar's out of control, it means they're in a catabolic state, which means their body's being destroyed. And they're probably going to be in a very weakened, even more vulnerable state from their immune system, all of inflammation. That's a really bad way to lose weight. <laughs> That's kind of like you are being destroyed. <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, not a good way to lose weight. Yeah. But that, that was a good question. Uh, but I, I don't think the drop in BMI in that situation would be protective. Yeah, unfortunately. And actually, they are seeing, one of the things they tell people to look for is unexplained weight loss in someone with COVID as a sign that maybe they had undiagnosed diabetes and the COVID was making it worse. Um, so now that you bring that up. Robin, were you going to say something? I we can't hear you. Muted. Yeah, here, let me see if I can unmute you. Okay, try it one more time then. Let me, let me, let me. There you go. You got rid of your echo. It sounds like you're doing okay now. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. I yes. <laughs> I think everybody's getting used to our technologies these days. It's like whenever something like that happens, you see everybody's. Oh. I have to call in. <laughs> okay. No, we can hear you. I can hear you. Robin, Maybe. we can hear you now. Oh, she might not hear us, though. Oh. Anybody else have a comment while she's calling in? We do have um, about 10 more minutes or so left in the hour, about eight minutes now. So I do appreciate all the questions uh, while Robin's getting set up, and she might actually just be call in okay she's saying she's going to call in for okay. a sec but uh definitely if you have a questions you don't feel like uh, bringing it up uh unmuting yourself go ahead and put it in the chat box um i believe it's miyaka it's good to hear you uh, see you again at least um she did want to express her appreciation for helping out with the patient that we had talked about earlier uh, the doctor was very happy regarding our discussion because she is not familiar with the cgms oh good so actually, that'll tie in perfect with uh, if Tashina can actually uh, be on next uh, month with the CGMs. Um, so Robin, um, yeah, I think, I mean, only during the day, right? You're trying to do the four hours during the day and then when they go to bed and then in the morning. Um, I know that I've just read handfuls of armfuls of oh she's lost all audio okay i will um uh dr greenley we will be um recording this and posting it on to our northwest portland area okay. Northwest channel so she can actually we can direct her to the um okay the uh but one thing maybe i'll send this to her but more and more people are using continuous glucose monitoring in people even temporarily so they have covid they're at home they're putting them on a cgm um one 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 from the office that type of thing but not everybody has that many cgms um so any of you have a suggestion how to get someone to check their blood sugars every four hours Any any hints for Robin? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think if they did, it depending on how sick they are and how high their blood sugars are and what their risk of low blood sugar is, you could probably do every six hours. But um, the the recommendation is every four hours and in some situations they actually recommend every two hours so that that's gonna if the, every two hours is probably going to be more like someone with type 1 diabetes um so but maybe for some of the patients if you could even do every six hours robin can you hear us now now i can yeah i, I think, think even six hours is better than what 
like what my nephew got, you know? Right. I know. I think it's just been hard because most of the people that I have are like the whole home has COVID. And so, and usually one of them may be in the hospital. And so that stress of the loved one in the hospital yeah. is just too much for them to even think about taking care of them themselves. Yeah. But, you know, knowing the difference it makes and I knowing know. why I think is, to me, a big driver, you know, uh, that, that their COVID actually gets worse if their blood sugar goes high, right. more COVID gets in their cells, more that cytokine storm is worse. And the cytokine, the infect, the, the infectious burden and the cytokine storm is what kills people. And so if the hyperglycemia is making the infectious burden worse and the cytokine storm worse, so, but, but I can see how that could be totally overwhelming and, yeah. um, yeah. And I don't know, I don't really have any scientific data or anything of this, but when I, somebody gets diagnosed, I tell them not to lo go to bed and lay down and sleep all day. Um, I've been telling them, you know, stay up, walk, do what you can. If you need to lay down and take a nap, try to be in a recliner or something so you're not laying flat. And um, those people have done so much better than those that don't listen to that. And I don't know what the scientific, yeah. maybe the fluid buildup in the lungs or whatever. But Yeah, that's are, interesting. I will watch yeah. for that kind of thing in the literature. And mm -hmm. I, I have a 36-year-old that also has alcoholism, but he wasn't listening you know I said don't go lay down and sleep because I knew his blood sugars were elevated because he'd been non-compliant for a while and came down with COVID he did really well the first three or four days his blood sugars were elevated and I just kept telling him don't don't lay down don't lay down fourth day he laid down woke up couldn't get you know he slept probably six hours during the day and ended up going to the hospital ICU for four or five days um and I just feel like he just didn't move enough to take care of himself. Well, it's, it's interesting that um, in many of the patients, if they lay them on their belly, that's mm -hmm. called proning, they oxygenate, oxygenate their lungs better. And I wonder when most people lay down, they don't lay down on their belly. Right. Um, and I wonder if there's something about the supine position that's bad or, you know, we'll have to, you know, we want, if you guys see anything, share with us, and I'll be watching for that as well um, to see if, if there's some scientific basis <laughs> for what, what you've noticed. But it Thank may you. have to do with oxygenation or, um, or just lack of, you know, just self-neglect when you're sleeping. And if you sleep, and I've heard of people like sleeping 10, 12, 14 hours during that time, you're not hydrating, you're not uh, checking the blood sugar, you're missing insulin. And so is the blood sugar getting higher? And then we know that if the, we now have proof that if the blood sugar gets higher, the COVID gets worse. So um, everybody has their hands full, but leave, leave this session today knowing that if you're working with people, if they don't have COVID, just keep re-emphasizing to them how to reduce exposure, you know, staying home as much as they can when they go out, the hand washing, the mask, the six feet away or more. Um, and then if they get it, just the importance of keeping their blood sugar under 180. I think there's just more and more, to me, there's enough evidence now that that makes a huge difference and enough explanation of why it makes a difference that uh, we just kind of need to labor through this with them and it, that it's worth the investment. And I think your case uh, from last month, Robin, really proves that, you know, she should have done horrible by all accounts. And I think it was your efforts that allowed her not to do horrible. So, okay, Eric, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Greenlee. Uh, very, very valuable information. Um, you know, I, I'm not uh, 
a physician as at all, but I do very much enjoy those presentations and you, and you make them worth my while in the sense that I can actually understand them. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, it was great seeing everybody uh, on the call. Just make sure if you guys need those CEUs in the chat box, uh, Janine uh, went ahead and provided that for us. Uh, so that way you can uh, just do the survey and then log into that kind of situation as well. So, and also, and if you do need help in between, do feel free to reach out in between. And uh, please, uh, Tashina, present your case or whoever said they would <laughs> present their case. Please, yeah. uh, we want a case. Okay. Um, I was just going to say we have a date change next month, right? Oh, yes. Thank you for that. Yes. I have we, to be on a, at a meeting. So it will be the third. Is it the third? It's the Thursday? 17th. I yeah, think is what we, what we talked about. So Just, that's, uh, yeah, that's brand yeah. new. It's announced and we'll send out in the email as well in any of my emails that I do send out to everybody, just letting everybody know that will be the following week, not the yeah. second Thursday, but the third we're, Thursday. We're actually having meetings for that 